about three or four years ago, we found out there's, there's been a long, long discussion about expanding the LA airport. How, how many of you have ever been to LA? Have you had the misfortune of being into, in, of going to our airport? <laughs> it's one of the busiest airports in the world, and most poorly designed and overcrowded. And we've, we've actually done a lot of work to uh, lift up the wages. So pretty, everybody at that airport now is unionized and making a living wage. <laughs> but, it, so there was, but there was going to be, this time, a real proposal for modernizing the airport. And an $11 billion proposal for modernizing the LA airport that was going to involve a lot of impact on the communities east of the airport. Now, if you, if you remember when you flew in, the airport is very close to the ocean. So the ocean is pretty much on the west. The, the south and the north of the airport are the more affluent uh, middle class communities, mostly white communities. And uh, the, the communities east of the airport, where, where most of the, the, the planes usually come in from the east, um, or sometimes over the ocean. But most of the flight path is over the east. The communities east of the airport are 99.9% .9 uh, communities of color, very low income, and huge, horrible impact from the airport, um, and really the unregulated airline industry. And there, the deregulation not only applies to fares, the, the, the background, but in terms of all the environmental standards and everything else that we think that should apply to such a major industry. So people suffering the impacts of that are the people east of LA Airport in Los Angeles. Uh, and if you, if you actually go to a very densely populated community, lots and lots of families. And if you go to Lenox, which is just adjacent to the airport, the mostly Latino immigrant community, you go to one of the schools, um, the schools have no windows, and they're like fortresses. And you, know, you see these little six, seven-year-old kids who are in these classrooms that have no windows. And you can't, the, the teachers actually have to stop talking for a minute or so, or every two minutes, because it's so loud that you can't hear. And, and then you go outside in the playground where these little kids are playing, and you're out there for five minutes, and you, you, know, you put a finger down your arm, and you see a line. There's so much soot, and there's so much pollution that's coming from that airport. So that you can imagine, there's the highest rates of asthma among children or any, you know, anywhere in the state or is near the airport, uh, and near our uh, port as well. So we had all that situation, and once again, we were going to have even greater impact against the, of, of, of these communities, and really very little benefit to these communities. So we decided that this was going to be an opportunity. We were going to make this an opportunity. Rather than suing over the environmental impact report and trying to hold it up again, we were going to actually try to do something proactive. So we went in, and we started organizing uh, amongst all sectors, La the, the labor movement, we, we organized all the key environmental organizations who had never not, not sued over the expansion of a major infrastructure. I mean, they never thought about what they would want. They just always thought about what they didn't want. And we got two school districts for, that, for those areas surrounding the airport, as well as parent groups and teacher groups and community groups it was a, a broad coalition of 26 organizations that we brought together, and we went through a process of coming up with 140 demands that were that covered the gamut. With the, the idea being that not only should we deal with the impacts of this upcoming modernization, but we should also deal with the past negative impacts, and the neighbors most directly impacted should be most benefited. So the idea that the jobs job training, job access, all the, those kinds of benefits should go to the people who are most impacted. So that's kind of the, the thesis that we came in with. And we went through a process, and we got the, the city department of airports to come to the table, and we went through a nine-month negotiation where we ended up with an agreement that's actually worth a half a billion dollars. And the agreement was signed by two school districts, by, and then by 26 organizations, um, this huge, massive community benefits agreement that is uh, doing all kinds of things, including $200 million for the schools right next to the airport, as well as major air quality studies, 
all of the new construction equipment is going to be um, is not going to be diesel. It's going to be electric fitted. The airlines, the airplanes are now no longer going to be able to just sit and idle on the runways while they wait for their next, you know, couple hours later. They're going to plug into electric gates and turn on the engines. A lot of really creative things came out of it. And then, fortunately for us, it was a very controversial project. So we worked really hard to get it adopted. And now we actually have this community benefits agreement that we are actively implementing. And we, because of the implementation challenges, we actually put in all kinds of creative things that would, would trigger, um, that would give us the ability leverage to enforce this, including having prior approval of every single contract that goes to the airport. And this agreement actually requires every single company that touches the airport, starting last July 1st, to pay a living wage, to um, do initial hiring from the hiring pool that, we cre that we're creating um, for the groups at each of the airport, um, as well as many other things. So that's another example of a community benefits agreement. And the, all, there was not a single environmental organization, including the Clean Air Coalition, Natural Resources Defense Council, Environmental Defense, the big, you know, the big environmentalists, they all signed away their right to sue. And they all signed on to this agreement. Um, which was a first for, for all of them. So that was that's a, that's a second story. And I think I'll stop there and take some questions. There are, I'd say there are four major components of success. And the first and foremost is the one you talked about, which is good organizing, which is patient, thoughtful, uh, assertive, organizing, take the extra steps to really bring people together and really go through a process of all for one and one for all and what that means. It means everyone needs to give up something, you know, get something and educate each other. That is definitely number one. Number two is you have to have good research. You cannot do these projects without having more information than the people on the other side. You have to know exactly what the project's about. You have to know what steps it has to go through, you have to know, the, you know potentially the money sources that it could get, um, you have to really, you have to have good research. Um, the third thing is you have to have political power. So you have to think about political power and then you have to have it. And that means you have to have relationships with your elected officials, you have to help educate them and strengthen them and give them the tools to back you up. And to the extent that you have people that are really opposed to anything that, that messes with the traditional paradigm, then maybe you need to kick them out. So political power is key. And the fourth thing is you've got to have a communication strategy. Because we're never going to be able to knock on every door. We're never going to be able to involve every person. And shaping the debate and the discussion, you know, it's, it's really who gets there first you know, in terms of your frame. And is this going to be a frame of uh, you're messing with the free market, you're, you're hurting private companies, you're messing with the business climate? If it's the business climate frame, you're dead. Or is it going to be a community benefits frame? What, we want a win-win here. We want something that lifts up our community. And we're worth it. We're worthy of respect. We're, we, don't, we don't have to take the lower common denominator because we've got a lot to offer. So if that's your frame, then you're going you're gonna to do a lot better. And you're going to really make it easier for your elected officials who ultimately you know, have to be accountable and have to think about their futures. And so giving them the tools. So really it takes those four elements to be successful. And then you need to have, you know, the legal, you need to have a legal team backing you up. And, and so that's, I think, a little easier. Uh, story one and story two regarding workers. Uh, were ordinances in effect for wages? prior to the starting, or did, is that, was that part of it? There, there were ordinances in effect requiring prevailing wage if there's any public money and of the construction, but not necessarily requiring that in the union, and requiring a living wage for the developer and the developer's contracted employees. So the developer, meaning the people that work directly for the developer, and then the subcontracted janitorial, security, 
landscape, parking that are going to be contracted directly with the developer. There were not an or there was not an ordinance in place. Well, there was at the airport. Airport is wall to wall. Um, but in terms of the private development, there was not an ordinance in place that would cover a Costco, for example, or you know the end tenant. So that that's something that we had to negotiate in and work into into the community benefits process. But the union organized building trades received their contract rates, correct? Pardon? Organized building trades that worked on the Costco or whatever, they got their contractual rates. The the building trades will have a PLA, actually, um, project labor agreement for the Adam Brea project. The uh, the um, airport project, the building trade had a PLA, but because there's federal money, it got invalidated by the Bush executive order, which prohibits PLAs on um, any project that has federal funding. So it's actually the leverage of the of the community benefits agreement that's helping the trades get the subcontractors, which is often where the problem is. You'll have union general contractors, but then they will subcontract out to non-union um, specialty specialty trades. And so with because the community benefits agreement gives us the ability to have prior approval on or at least prior knowledge and prior input on every contract, that's that's leverage that's helping to make sure that those subcontractor jobs are also good jobs. If you had to say no to somebody for the first time, what was the fall-off from that? And, and at what length of time did it take you guys to get back to work to track Costco, the uh, development site? To win the, the to actually was, it, was there a fall-off cost initially? Were you being criticized? Was the group being criticized or any deal? Absolutely. There are definitely people in South LA who said, see, we told you, you ask for too much, they're going to go away. And we said, well, we don't want them anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, but right after we said we didn't want them anyway, we said, well, let's figure out what we do want. And let's work together to, to make this a good project. And that's when we started the visioning process and, you know, convincing the city to do a request for proposal. Some might argue that you're you're LA, you're you're a West Coast, you're more progressive than South Indiana. Um, in this case. <laughs> I don't know, you're you, you guys have a lot better understanding of unions than we do in our open shop Los Angeles. So I mean, what would we say to a naysayer who say, well no, they're bargaining from Los Angeles. It's a lot different than bargaining from South Bend. What would you say would be a good argument against a point of view like that? Well, I would say, I would ask the person if they've ever been to South Central Los Angeles, because, uh, you know, I'd rather live in South Bend, Indiana any day than South Central Los Angeles. It's, you know, it's pretty dismal in terms of development, and developers that want to go there. So, but ultimately, it's really a matter of respect. And we, we ran a campaign, you may have heard about, where Walmart wanted to come in to a, it's a South Central LA city called Inglewood. And traditionally African American, increasingly Latino immigrant, very poor community, but with the largest piece of undeveloped land in Los Angeles County. Los Angeles County is completely built out. There's no sprawl, I mean, there's no more sprawl possible. It's sprawl. <laughs> so this is a very prime piece of land, and Walmart wanted to come in with a superstore. And, you know, Walmart came in and they actually put something on the ballot that would have given them carte blanche with no city oversight at all. Um, and they really, what they wanted to do was people to sign with their democratic right and have a say so. But what they came and said is, we're gonna bring in the jobs, we're gonna bring in beautiful development on this horrible site. And we did polling originally, initially, and you know, 70% or 80% were supported. And we didn't have resources that Walmart had, uh, but we went around and, and we said, look, this is about respect. Do we just want to have them come in and waive our rights and just give us any old thing? Don't we feel like we deserve to have good jobs and, and a place where we have our you know, say? And we turned it. Um, it ended up being defeated 60-something percent to 38 percent, 62, I think 38. Um, and, this is by people who really wanted a job and who really wanted this to come, who wanted a Walmart, like Walmart, but they just felt disrespected. So there's no, there's no quick 
you know, magic bullet that is going to answer that in a or question. It's really a question, you know, it's a matter of gaining confidence over time and trying to really change the, you know, change to the competing vision. Yes. Yeah, uh, I'm interested in your uh, thoughts on keeping the coalition together because you've got a lot of broad groups with different aims, housing, labor, environmental, uh, social justice, and how do you, and you've got to make compromises, uh, obviously, to give and take process. So could you speak to that in terms of keeping that coalition moving forward? <coughs> it's not easy to keep coalitions together, and there are groups in, there are groups around the country now who are organizing for and winning community benefits agreements in many cities, including Milwaukee, which won a great one last year. And in almost every case, there have been groups that have walked away. And fortunately, in our case, in every case where there are groups that walked away, they did so quietly. Um, they didn't like it. They just couldn't give up the right to sue, or they just didn't feel comfortable. They didn't feel like they were getting enough. Um, they didn't like the idea of supporting development projects, they just they felt that was, you know, against their principle, or a, a myriad of things. And in our case, they walked away quietly. There, there was a case in San Diego where there was a major community benefits agreement one for this huge downtown project. Um, it's the big project next to the, um, the downtown ballpark. And, and there was an environmental group who wanted to see more housing, more affordable housing in this, this poor neighborhood right next to downtown. And the coalition decided to, to settle for something um, that they felt was good, 20% and, 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 and an investment of a couple million dollars. They didn't feel good about it. They withdrew from the coalition and they acted to campaign against the project. And it got kind of ugly. But in the end, you know, the rest of the group stayed together and the project got approved and it was a great victory. And I think that this group didn't look very good, but you know, so that's a bad, that's a, a negative story. But I think in the end, it's just you know, patient, good organizing. It's just the hard work of listening and talking, and then ultimately being okay. If, you know, there's one out of a hundred people that just don't feel good about it and walk away. Yes. Um, it's the impossible uh, when it comes to developing political power. Was it something that grew up over time as you went through your failures rather than success to find out you developed these four points of success? Or is there, a, I know it's a nice quote, what was, what was a, a, a key point to your developing that effect? I mean, if you know somebody living in the neighborhood, do you have anything to throw in the United States? Sure. I mean, the first thing that was helpful was simply recognizing that there were those four things. So it's just the fact of understanding that we had to do all those things in order to be successful. So we, we planned a lot differently once we, once we recognized that. And the political power is, it's not just electing people. I mean, obviously, we need to be there for our friends, and we need to back them up. We need to help them get reelected. We need to give them cover. We need to help give them the information they need. We need to be there for them. Um, and for someone who really we tried and tried and is not going to do it, we need to take them out. So, you know, how do you take someone out and put someone else good in? It's, it's a long process. It may take, it may take years. But, uh, you know, I think the, the, the positive and the negative is a really compelling um, evidence of your power. And you've got a great situation here where you defeated something. You defeated something big, despite all the political support that it had. And so that can go two ways. One way is that uh, you are seen as NIMBYs, not in my backyard, and you're seen as anti-development, and nothing is okay, and that's not going to help you build very much political power. But you could also put a, a growth is justice vision out there. Okay, this project was a no-go because of these things, but in other circumstances, we could be supportive of development and you know, this kind of development. And you know, that could be the beginning of a conversation with public officials or with you know, potential developers to say, okay, well, this is what we're willing to, you know, to work, work with and for. 
So, you know, but political, you already have a head start on showing them power. Yeah. Uh, could you give us a background on how your organization, how your position and your uh, alliance came about? Sure. Uh, the nonprofit organization that I run is, uh, we, we actually have a you know, pretty good sized staff and budget and have an active fundraising program. We were started in 1993, and there's, a, there's a, it's actually an interesting story. There's actually going to be a national PBS special on, P, on television on Thursday night. I'm not sure what time it's on here, but it's called The New Los Angeles, which tells the, which actually shows the story. Um, in, in the late 80s, early 90s, there was a, a hotel workers union which had changed dramatically, and there was an old white conservative leadership that refused to allow the membership meetings to be translated into Spanish, even though 80-90% of the housekeepers and, and other employees were Spanish-speaking, and they closed the doors at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, even though that's when most of the workers got off work. And it, you know, this is the worst of the worst, and this union was losing, was you know, hemorrhaging membership left and right. So there was a Latina daughter of farm workers who was working as an organizer, and she led a revolt to essentially kick out the old leadership and let the new slate of Latino immigrant leaders and turn that union around. And what a couple of years forward, after they kind of built a little bit more stable local, she recruited me to actually start this new organization. And she paid my salary for a year and it helped us get started. She's the chair of our board. She's now, Maria Elena Dorado, she's now the head of the whole labor movement for Los Angeles. Um, the only Latina that I know of um, in the country that has a large labor movement. And so she, you know, and the idea when we got started was, was, was a really vague one. You know, we want to we wanna do more research, do more policy, we want to lift up an issue of the working poor and, it, you know, in Los Angeles. And we started building from there. So it started out by me being only me, and we now have 27 employees. So it's in that we have a number of unions. I mean, given that Los Angeles is a city that's majority minority, we have 60% of the population is Latino, and about 10% of the population is African American, and about 10% is Asian. So I think it's about 30% white. So we have a different makeup than you might have in Indiana, just from what I've seen. Um, <laughs> fortunately, we do have a number of unions which have leadership of color. And there are really increasing efforts within the leadership of the labor movement to be very inclusive. And what I mean by that is to address the history of exclusion by primarily by certain employers. And, and in some of the major service industries like janitorial and like hotels and restaurants, those jobs used to be held primarily by African Americans. And they were actually unionized and better jobs. And then in the 80s, these employers basically fired everybody willy-nilly. And what they did was they contracted out the workforce. Story we've heard many times, right? And the contractors they brought in brought in um, almost entirely Latino immigrant workforce, paying minimum wage or less. And so over the years, that workforce has become organized. And now the leadership of those unions has really reached out to the African American leadership, and there still is some African American membership, particularly in the security industry, which SEIU is organizing in Los Angeles. But part of the demands that have been on the table now for hotel workers contracts and for janitorial contracts has been stopping the exclusion of African Americans into those um, jobs and actually 
opening up those jobs affirmatively to you African Americans. And the Latino leaders of those unions have actually raised those issues and they have brought African American comrades to the table. So there are those efforts to deal with the, the challenges of exclusion, you know, past exclusion and racism in a really positive way. So it's not perfect, but it's not losing. Mm -hmm. What about that retreat? Uh, part of the enemy. <laughs> and I think that that, again, is a struggle. But there's a big push by a number of people to open up the trades. Open up the, you know, increase the opportunity for unionization in major developments, and as, as a condition of that, uh, require that a certain percentage of the jobs go to women and people of color. So the idea is to try to find a win-win to transform our labor movement as well as our industry. Ellen, for maybe one more question. Wouldn't that part of that be addressed under the community benefit agreement because the Brennan Law Center does something similar to this and mentions that in the negotiation process with the building trade that they work that percentage of new employees that are, would be getting training uh, to include X amount of local people, either minority or people living in the area, affected area. That's a big part of the community benefit agreement for new projects. And what I was talking about is existing jobs. So, you know, both, both sides of the coin. Thank you for joining me and talking about